Structural welding is a process whereby the parts to be connected are heated and fused with supplementary molten metal added to the joint. A relatively small depth of material will become molten and upon cooling, the structural steel and the weld metal will act as one continuous part where they are joined. The additional metal, sometimes referred to as filler metal, is deposited from a special electrode, which is part of an electrical circuit that includes the connected part or base metal. In the shielded metal arc welding process, current arcs across a gap between the electrode and base metal, heating the connected parts and depositing part of the electrode into the molten base metal. A special coating on the electrode vaporizes and forms a protective gaseous shield, preventing the molted weld metal from oxidizing before it solidifies. The electrode is moved across the joint and a weld bead is deposited, its size depending on the rate of travel of the electrode. As the weld cools, impurities rise to the surface, forming a coating called slag that must be removed before the member is painted or another pass is made with the electrode. Shielded metal arc welding is normally done manually and is the process universally used for field welds. For shop welding, an automatic or semi-automatic process is usually used. Foremost among these processes is submerged arc welding. In this process, the end of the electrode and the arc are submerged in a granular flux that melts and forms a gaseous shield. There is more penetration into the base metal than with the shielded metal arc welding and the higher strength results. Other commonly used processes for shop welding include gas shielded metal arc, flux cord arc, and electro slag welding. Quality control of welded connections is particularly difficult because defects below the surface or even minor flaws at the surface will escape visual detection. Welders must be properly certified and for critical work, special inspection techniques such as radiography or ultrasonic testing must be used. The two most common types of welds are the fillet weld and the groove weld. Fillet welds are placed in a corner formed by two parts in contact. Fillet welds can also be used in a T joint. Groove welds are those deposited in a gap or a groove between two parts to be connected. They are most frequently used for butt, T and corner joints. In most cases, one or both of the connected parts will have beveled edges called prepared edges. Although relatively thin material can be groove welded with no edge preparation. The welds shown are complete penetration welds and can be made from one side, sometimes with the aid of a backing bar. Partial penetration groove welds can be made from one or both sides with or without edge preparation. Here is shown plug or slot weld, which sometimes is used when more weld is needed then length of edge is available. A circular or slotted hole is cut in one of the parts to be connected and is filled with the weld metal. Of the major types of welds, fillet welds are the most common and are considered here in some detail. The design of complete penetration groove welds is a trivial exercise in that the weld will have the same strength as the base metal and the connected parts can be treated as completely continuous at the joint. The strength of a partial penetration groove weld will depend on the amount of penetration. Once that has been determined, the design procedure will be essentially the same as that for a fillet weld. The design and analysis of fillet welds is based on the assumption that the cross section of the weld is a 45 degree right triangle. Any reinforcement or penetration is neglected. The size of a fillet weld is denoted W and is the length of one of the two equal sides of the idealized cross section. Standard weld sizes are specified in increments of 1 over 16th of an inch. 
Although a length of weld can be loaded in any direction in shear, compression, or tension, a fillet weld is weakest in shear and is always assumed to fail in this mode. Specifically, failure is assumed to occur in shear on a plane through the throat of the weld. For fillet welds made with the shielded metal arc process, the throat is the perpendicular distance from the corner or root of the weld to the hypotenuse and is equal to 0.707 times the size of the weld. Thus, for a given length of weld L subjected to a load of P, the critical shearing stress is the load P divided by 0.707 times the size of the weld W times the length of the weld L. If the weld ultimate shearing stress FNW is used in this equation, the nominal load capacity of the weld can be written as 0.707 times W times L times the ultimate shear strength of the weld FNW. The strength of a fillet weld depends on the weld metal used. It is a function of the type of electrode. The strength of the electrode is defined as its ultimate tensile strength, with strengths of 60 to 120 kips per square inch available for the shielded metal arc welding process. The standard notation for specifying an electrode is the letter E followed by two or three digits indicating the tensile strength in kips per square inch and two digits specifying the type of coating. As strength is the property of primary concern to the design engineer, the last two digits are usually represented by XX. Electrodes should be selected to match the base metal. For the commonly used grades of steel, only these two electrodes need be considered. The design strengths of welds are given in AISC table J2.5. The ultimate shearing stress, FNW, in a fillet weld is 0.6 times the tensile strength of the weld metal denoted FEXX. AISC section J2.4b presents an alternative strength that accounts for the direction of the load for fillet welds where strain compatibility of the various weld elements is considered. If the angle between the direction of the load and the axis of the weld is denoted theta, the nominal fillet weld strength is the following. We can see that if the angle theta is zero, the ultimate shearing stress remains the same, but when it is 90 degrees, the strength is 50% higher. For simple, that is concentrically loaded welded connections, with both longitudinal and transverse welds, AISC specifies that the larger nominal strength from the following two options can be used. Either use the basic weld strength of FNW for both the longitudinal and transverse welds, or use the 50% increase for the transverse weld but reduce the basic strength by 15% for the longitudinal welds. For LRFD, the design strength of a fillet weld is phi Rn, where phi is equal to 0.75. An additional requirement is that the shear on the base metal cannot exceed the shear strength of the base metal. This means that we cannot use a weld shear strength larger than the base metal shear strength, so the base metal shear strength is an upper limit on the weld shear strength. This requirement can be explained by an examination of this welded connection. Although both the gusset plate and the tension member plate are subject to shear, we will examine the shear on the gusset plate adjacent to the weld AB. The shear would occur along the line AB and subject an area of T multiplied by L to shear. The shear strength of the weld AB cannot exceed the shear strength of the base metal corresponding to an area T times L. The gusset plate can fail either due to shear yielding or shear rupture. In summary, the following set of equations would need to be checked. They can also be written in terms of unit length for convenience. We can simplify the weld strength equations even further when using E70 electrodes and writing the weld width in terms of 1 over 16th of an inch. So, as an example, 
When having a weld of size 3 over 16 inches, the strength per inch is simply 1.392 times 3. The minimum weld size W permitted is a function of the thickness of the inner connected part and is given in AISC table J2.4. Along the edge of a part less than 1 over 4 inch thick, the maximum fillet weld size is equal to the thickness of the part. For parts 1 over 4 inch or more in thickness, the maximum size is T minus 1 over 16th of an inch, where T is the thickness of the part. The minimum permissible length of a fillet weld is 4 times its size. If this length is not available, a shorter length can be used if the effective size of the weld is taken as 1 fourth its length. An example is shown here where the length of the connected part might be shorter than 4 times the weld size. AISC does not impose a limit on the length of welds except for end-loaded welds. End-loaded welds are longitudinal welds at the end of an axially loaded member. If the length exceeds 100 times the weld size, a reduced effective length is used in the computation of strength. The effective length is obtained by multiplying the actual length by a factor beta. If the length is larger than 300 times the weld size, use an effective length of 180 times the size of the weld. When a weld extends to the end of a member, it is sometimes continued around the corner. The primary reason for this continuation, called an end return, is to ensure that the weld size is maintained over the full length of the weld. The AISC specification does not require end returns. Small welds are generally cheaper than large welds. The maximum size that can be made with a single pass of the electrode is approximately 5 over 16 inches, and multiple passes will add to the cost. In addition, for a given load capacity, although a small weld must be made longer, a larger and shorter weld will require more volume of weld metal. Reducing the volume of weld metal will also minimize heat buildup and residual stresses. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.